What's up guys, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I'm back with more Mordentunes Tome of Foes coverage. Buckle up, this may be a long one. As I discussed in my previous videos and my What's New video, I was going to go through and talk about what was new in the books, comparing things that were in, Arth in Unearthed Arcana, like Tiefling sub-races, Elf sub-races, and the Gith, and that I've done that. I decided not to do a review of the Dwergar, or Durgar, or however you want to pronounce it, or the Sref Neblin, because they were both published in Sword Coast Adventures Guide, Surf Neblin was also published in the Elemental Evil Players Companion, and those are exactly the same and have had zero changes, so there's no reason to do a separate video on them. That being said, I did say I was going to take a section and review each of the monsters in the bestiary uh, in the sections of A through C, D through F, G through L, N through R, and S through Y. The D section is going to be a little bit long, and I may break that out because we have Devils, Demons, Demon Lords, and the Demon Lords, I'm going to do a comparison of them in Morden Canaan's Tome of Foes versus their appearance in Out of the Abyss to see if there's any differences there. So, that being said, we're going to jump here. Um, I did say, in my, uh, by the way, in my D&D Beyond video that I was not a huge fan of D&D Beyond when it came out. I still kind of feel that way, that I feel like D&D Beyond came a little too late into the world for a digital tool set in a game where we are primarily, I'd say, uh, we're a digital culture. And D&D Beyond is useful, and the reason that I happen to have these books in there is that they go live at exactly midnight. So if I want to start doing coverage of these videos before my local game store gets the book in hand, I can buy this online, usually at a discount with a discount code, and get it as soon as possible. So I just wanted to deal with that in case anybody was like, why did you shit on D&D Beyond so hard in your D&D Beyond video, and now you're using it? So that, just to get that out of there. So first up is the Alep. And we can see here, as with in Warden Kane's Tome of Foes, you have your kind of text around it, your background text regarding the monster, and then the actual stat block. I will remind you, if you are unaware, that if you click this and you have it in D&D Beyond, it gives you the stat block as it would appear in your uh, book. You can write comments here if you would like to, but probably the most important thing is this little button right here. I did a whole video on it, but anything you purchase in D&D Beyond, you can click this little button right here, and it will play for you the pronunciation of these monsters. In the past, it was done by Marisha Ray and Matt Mercer. It sounds like, having listened through this, that it's Chris Perkins and Kate Welch doing the pronunciation, so I'll play this one right now. Alep. Alep. So that's an Alep. Not super hard, but there's some of the demons have funky names. So, But I just wanted to remind you, and if I'm describing them... I don't know how to pronounce them, that's what I'm going to do. So, what is an Alep? An Alep is a fifth uh, or CR5 undead creature. You can see it's kind of got this smoky appearance. I think we click on that, it'll open it up, get us a little closer look at it. Uh, so, let's see. When a mind uncovers a secret that's a powerful being, a powerful being is protected with a mighty curse, the result is often the emergence of an Alep. Secrets protected in this manner range to scope from a Demon Lord's true name to a hidden truth of the cosmic order. So, it is undead, doesn't need to eat, drink, or sleep. Let's take a look. So, not crazy AC or a ton of hit points. It can't walk, it can only fly. Its stats are pretty solid. Saving throws and intelligence and wisdom, perception and stealth checks. Resistance to pretty much undead resistances. Acid, fire, lightning, thunder, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magic. And undead immunity is cold, necrotic, and poison. And pretty much immunity to what looks like every single, uh, pretty much every condition with the exception of stunned. Um, dark vision, whatever language is it, new knife. It can move through objects. It takes damage if it ends its turn within an object. It has a maddening touch, which is a melee attack. That does 46 plus 3 psychic damage. That's no joke. And then whispers of madness. Chooses three creatures within 60 feet to make a wisdom save or take a d8 psychic damage. And must use its reaction to make a melee weapon attack against one creature of the Alep's choice that the Alep can see. So this could be pretty nasty if you get a group of people kind of crowded together and it pulls this off. Everybody has to attack one another. Especially if you have a pretty beefy physical uh, party. Like you have a barbarian that say may already be raging. Or something like that you could do. Or someone with like a fairly powerful magical weapon. And they have Howling Babble. This is a recharge of six abilities. This is a once... You know, it may be once to twice per combat, depending on how you roll on your d6s. Each creature within 30 feet must make a same wisdom save, or take 2d8 plus 3 psychic damage, and is stunned until the end of its next turn. A successful save takes half as much damage and isn't stunned. Constructs and undead are immune to this effect. 
So this is a pretty nasty little creature. Um, the health and the AC make me think like, oh, it shouldn't be CR5, but its abilities are pretty strong and the resistances and immunities kind of make up for that. So the Astral Dreadnought, this is a fairly popular uh, monster. It's been around for a long time. Uh, some of you may recognize its appearance. It's pretty nasty looking. It's a CR21. So I'd say, I don't know, maybe a large majority of people's games that will never get into a situation where they'll be able to encounter one of these and survive. But if you're playing a high level campaign or just doing a one shot that's high level, this may be uh, something for you. So these are basically terrifying creatures that haunt the astral plane. Um, they've been gliding through the astral mist since the dawn of time of the multiverse. And yeah, constellations appear to swirl in a single eye. So it's got, um, oh, let's see, uh, Tharzadun, the chain god, created astral dreadnought, the devoured planet. Uh, planar travelers who were seeking portals that lead from the astral plane to the outer planes, portals they might gaze upon their gods, blah, 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 blah. So I would actually recommend if you're curious about, uh, I would highly recommend that you go check out Jordan, uh, on YouTube. If you're kind of a little bit confused about Tharzadun and all that kind of stuff, um, I'll put a link in the description to his video. Uh, he basically has a Forgotten Realms explained videos and goes through the history of the Forgotten Realms from like the beginning of time through the end and while you may say well why forgotten realms i the main focus of a campaign setting for fifth edition is forgotten realms although that may change later this year uh, it does discuss a lot of that so let's get into it here so a cr 21 20 ac 297 hit points this thing is pretty beefy we've got a 28 strength and a 25 con um means it's going to be able to hit like a truck and take a ton of damage uh resistances to non-magical weapon attacks and looks like pretty much every single condition it is immune to. So it has an anti-magic cone similar to a Beholder in that uh, its open eye creates an area of anti-magic. It's a 150-foot cone. I believe a Beholder's is only 120. Um, at the start of each of its turn, it decides which way the cone faces. The cone doesn't function while the Dreadnought's eye is closed or while it is blinded. Oh, I guess it's not immune to blind, so you do have that opportunity. All right, it can't leave the Astral Plane, nor can it be banished, otherwise transported out of the Astral Plane. So potentially not something that you'll encounter too much unless you're in the astral plane um and if this thing is running around there maybe just don't go there uh demi planar donjon uh any creature or object that the astral dreadnought swallows is transported to a demi plane that can be entered by no other means except for a wish or this creature's uh visit ability a creature can leave the demi plane only by using magic that enables planar travel such as plane shift the Demiplane resembles a stone cave roughly a thousand feet in diameter and it with a ceiling a hundred feet high. Like a stomach, it contains the remains of its past meals. It can't be harmed from within the Demiplane. If it dies, the Demiplane disappears and everything in it appears around the corpse. The Demiplane is otherwise indestructible. Three legendary resistance. Its attacks are magical. And it has the ability to sever the silver cord. So if you're astral projecting, uh, it has the ability to cut the silver cord that tethers you to the material plane, therefore killing you. Uh, your astral form and your body three attacks one bite and two claws its bite is a plus 16 to hit does 5d 10 plus 9 piercing if the target is huge size or smaller the damage reduces it to zero or it's incapacitated it swallows you whole the target swallowed along with everything it's wearing is brought to the dummy plane that we talked about and its claws are plus 16 to hit with a 20 foot reach the bite is 10 foot reach 3d6 plus 9 this is a nasty thing you do not want to fight one of these uh, and it has legendary actions. Uh, one is three legendary actions. One is a claw. Two is to visit the demi plane. One creature that is huge or smaller that the astral dreadnought can see within 60 feet must succeed on a DC 19 charisma save or be magically transported to an unoccupied space on the floor of its demi plane. Uh, or psychic projection. Each creature within 60 feet of the astral dreadnought must make a DC 19 wisdom save or take 2d10 plus 4 psychic damage, which isn't that bad. That costs three. Uh, three actions to do so, I feel like you'd be better off doing more claw attacks. 3d6 plus 9 versus 2d10 plus 4. Huh. Alright, so we have the Balhanoth. Uh, this is a just a pretty nasty creature from the Shadowfell. Uh, you may recognize it as it had appeared in an episode of Dice Camera Action. Um, it does have lair actions, which is pretty cool. So it's lair actions, warp reality around it in a 500 foot square. After 10 minutes, the terrain in the area reshapes to assume the appearance of a location sought by one intelligence creature whose mind the Balhanoth has read. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, it targets one creature within 500 feet. They must succeed on a wisdom save along with, uh, or 
The target, along with whatever it's wearing, teleports to an unoccupied space within 60 feet of its choice. If targets one creature within 500 feet, they must make a wisdom save. Or the Balhanoth becomes invisible to that creature for one minute. Its regional effects, creatures within one mile of its lair experience a sensation of being close to whatever they desire most. Sensation grows stronger the closer it gets to so this is a pretty nasty thing being able to make you think that it has whatever you want and draw you close to it. It can sense the strongest desires of any humanoid within one mile and learns whether the desire involves a place, a safe location to rest, a temple, a home, or whatever else. Uh, if it dies, these effects end immediately. So this is a pretty nasty looking aberration here. It kind of looks like an Otiug and a Roper with just an even nastier mouth. Um, so we are uh, CR 11, so you know we've kind of jumped from a CR what is it, 21 to 11 here. Uh, but still, 17 AC, 114 HP, pretty solid, decent stats all around. It's only immune to being blind, because as you can see, it doesn't actually have any eyes. Uh, but it is blind beyond its 500-foot range of blind sight, which is insane. It has telepathy out to a mile, so this is how it can help to draw people in. It has two legendary resistances. It has a multi-attack for a bite attack and two tentacles, or four tentacle attacks. The bite is 40, 10, plus 3. Uh, the tentacle has a 10-foot reach, 2d6 plus 3 bludgeoning. The target is now grappled and is moved 5 feet towards it until the grapple end. They are also restrained, and it can't use that tentacle to target another creature. It has 4 tentacles. And it has 3 legendary actions. 1, to make a bite attack against 1 target. It has grapple. Teleport, which makes this thing even more terrifying. It magically teleports along with any equipment it is wearing or carrying any creatures it has grappled up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space. And it can become invisible for up to 10 minutes or until immediately after it makes an attack roll. So that's what makes this thing terrifying. Because it can teleport, which means it can grab you 10 feet away and then just bamf somewhere else. Or turn invisible and leave you kind of in the dark as to where it actually is. That's pretty crazy. Alright, so we have, I believe this would be a Burbalang. Which is a kind of weird gremlin looking creature. Uh, a lot of aberrations in this book, which is why I thought we were going to get more on uh, the, the Far Realm and things like that. So they cross, uh, keep, creep across the petrified remains of dead gods adrift on the astral plane. A lot of astral plane, a lot of shadow fell. Why did we not get more information about that? I'm a little shocked. This is only a CR2, so this is a fairly good thing to interact with a lower level party. Um, so let's see. They have 38 hit points, 14 AC... Stats are mediocre. A lot of skill proficiencies. They have true sight up to 120 feet. It can speak all languages, but it rarely does. So good luck sneaking up on this guy invisibly or using your illusions. Spectral Duplicate recharges on a short or long rest. As a bonus action, the Burbalang creates one spectral duplicate of itself in an unoccupied space it can see within 60 feet. While the duplicate exists, the Burbalang is unconscious. A Burbalang can have only one duplicate at a time. The duplicate disappears when it or the Burbalang drops to zero hit points or when it is dismissed. Uh, the duplicate has the same statistics and knowledge as the Burbalang and everything experienced by the duplicate is known. It's kind of like a shadow clone, if you will. All damage dealt by the duplicate's attacks is psychic damage. So that's pretty crazy. You can get past your Barbarian pretty easily. It does have innate spellcasting with a DC of 13. It has speak with dead at will and plane shift once per day on itself only. And it makes two attacks, one with a bite and one with a claw, 1d10 plus 3 on the bite, and 2d4 plus 3 on the claw. So it's not super damaging, but the fact that it can send its duplicate that does only psychic damage and that it is fully aware of what happens. So let's take a look here. The knowledge uh, that Burbalangs accumulate make them great resources of information for powerful people traveling the plains. Uh, they ignore petitioners, however, unless they they come bearing a choice secret or the bones of a particular interesting creature. Githyanki have found a way to coexist with them and sometimes use the, see the creatures to spy on their enemies and watch over their creches? I don't know, on the material plane. Let's just confirm the pronunciation was correct. Burbalang. Yep, okay, I was right. All right, so Bone Claw. Full stop, this is one of my favorite monsters from earlier editions. They just look so nasty, and it's a cool undead. It kind of reminds me of a bone devil, uh, and you just don't want to mess with these guys. And I don't know, I just for whatever reason, I just have a personal like for these creatures. The claws are pretty nasty. I don't know if it invokes like a weird Freddy Krueger vibe in me, and that's why I like them. I'm not sure. But let's take a look up here. So a wizard who tries, and okay, and this is another reason why, is the story behind them. <coughs> 
So a wizard who tries to become a lich but fails becomes a bone claw. So first, right there, you can have a ton of awesome RP story reasons as to why one of these would exist in whether it's a Forgotten Realms campaign or your own homebrew campaign. That's so cool. These hideous cackling undead share a few of the lich's attributes, but where liches are immortal masters of the arcane, bone claws are slaves to darkness, hatred, and pain. Uh, the most important part of the transformation ritual occurs when the soul of the aspiring lich migrates to a prepared phylactery. If the spellcaster is too physically weak or magically weak to compel the soul into its prison, the soul instead seeks out a new master, a humanoid within a few miles who has an unusually hate-filled heart. The soul bonds itself to the foul essence it finds in that person, and the bone claw becomes forever enslaved to its new master's wishes and subconscious whims. It forms near its master, sometimes appearing before the individual to receive orders, and other times simply setting about the fulfillment of its master's desires. So not only is it this cool story about someone who wanted to be a lich, but they're automatically enslaved to whatever evil creature is nearby. Which, if you're just an aspiring evil creature and this happens, talk about how like lucky you are that this happens. I'm going to read the whole thing because I love these creatures. Uh, it can't be destroyed while its master lives. No matter what happens to a bone claw's body, it reforms within hours as long as its master is still alive. It can so serve only evil, so no good bone claws out there. Um, they delight in murder and nothing pleases them more than causing horrific pain. They lurk like spiders in shadowy recesses waiting for victims to approach with their long bony limbs. Once spirit, a creature is pulled into the darkness to be sliced apart or teleported elsewhere to be tortured to death. Um, a Boneclaw's master might not want such a servant or even know that it has one. Boneclaws bind to petty criminals, bullies, and even particularly cruel children. Even if the master is unaware of its new horrid bodyguard, its local area will be plagued by disappearances and grisly murders tied together by the common thread of the master's envy or hunger for revenge. So again... Talk about awesome storyline potential here. I mean, I think we can all probably agree that one of the most terrifying things, and it preys on it, and that's why so many things like this exist, is the, like, spooky, terrifying child monster thing. So, like, you have a really angry child that doesn't know, and the bone claws their servant, and then, like, it just starts killing the people that they don't like because it knows what they want, but it doesn't even know that it has it. Like, that... There's a ton of really awesome storyline ideas for this. So on top of what it is, the, the art, like the reason and the lore behind it, so cool. So CR12, so it's a pretty high level undead. We don't have a ton of those. It's pretty disparaging in the monster manual, right? You start pretty low end like zombies and skeletons and you got like liches. There's a couple things sprinkled in between there, like ghasts and whites and things. But I feel like there's not a lot of like mid range, like a bone claw could be an okay, potentially for a, like a level 10 party. Um, you know, depending. Anyway, 127 HP, 16 AC. Uh, a lot of undead resistances. Not as many as your typical undead. Cold, necrotic, blood being piercing, and slashing from non magical attacks. Those are resistances. Does not have any damage immunities. And does it mean to charm, exhaustion, frighten, paralyze, and poison. Dark vision has dex, con, and wisdom save. So all of the most common saving throws it has proficiency in. As we discussed, when its master lives, it is uh, it gains a new body in 1d10 hours with all of its hit points. Its body appears within one mile of its master. While in dim light or darkness, the bone claw can hide as a bonus action. Makes two attacks with its piercing claw. Has 15 foot reach. Just imagine these long, stretchy, nasty arms with these big claws. Uh, 3d10 plus 4 piercing damage. If the target is a creature, it can pull the target up to 10 feet towards itself, and the target is grappled. The bone claw has two claws. While a claw grapples a target, the claw can um, the claw can only attack that target. Shadow jump. If the bone claw is in dim light or darkness, each creature of the bone claw's choice within five feet of it must succeed on a DC 14 Constitution saving throw or take 5d12 plus two necrotic damage. The bone claw can then teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space it can see. It can bring one creature it's grappling, teleporting that creature to an unoccupied space it can see within five feet of its destination. Destination spaces. Uh, of this teleportation must be in dim light or darkness and it has its deadly reach as a reaction in response to a visible enemy moving into its reach the bone claw makes one claw attack against that enemy if the attack hits the bone claw makes a second claw attack against the target so it has a reaction to basically make two attacks which is nonsense this thing could seriously mess up a party and they're terrifying looking and their story is awesome so big fan and we're already on to C's. There's not a, a ton in the beginning here. So we're on to the Cadaver Collector. 
I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory if you look at the image here. Uh, sorry if my camera, I'll shrink it down a little bit, is blocking some stuff off here. Um, but basically, this is a construct, ancient war machines that basically picks up bodies, as you can see. Um, they obey their summoners until dismissed back to Charon, Archeron, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, basically called upon by a necromancer or something of that nature. Uh, they might wander the material plane for centuries, collecting corpses while searching for a way home. Um, this rounds to summons from Immortal, once uh, just seen a great battle, either one in progress or one is imminent or where one took place. They encase themselves in the armor and weapons of fallen warriors and impale corpses onto them. Corpses that accumulate on the contract shell aren't just grisly battle trophies. A cadaver collector can summon the spirits of these cadavers to join battle with its enemies to paralyze more creatures for eventual, uh, eventual impalement. So, CR 14, 17 AC, 189 HP, a bunch of immunities, necrotic, poison, psychic, and bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage from magical attacks that aren't adamantine, charmed, exhaustion, frightened, paralyzed, petrified, poison. Um, it has advantage on, it's like a typical construct, advantage on saving throws versus spells and spell-like effects. Summon specters, once per short or long rest. As a bonus action, the cadaver collector calls up to, calls up the enslaved spirits, 1d6 specters without sunlight sensitivity arise in unoccupied spaces within 15 feet of the cadaver collector. These specters are, uh, act right after the cadaver collector on the same initiative count and fight until they're destroyed. They disappear when the cadaver collector is destroyed. Makes two slam attacks that are 3d8 plus 5 plus 3d10 necrotic damage. So that's pretty nasty. And like higher end uh, golems and constructs, it has a breath weapon. Uh, paralyzing breath, 5d6. It's a 30 foot cone, DC 18 con save or be paralyzed for one minute. Paralyzed creature repeats the saving throw at the end of each of its turns. That's pretty nasty. We have a choker. This is, um, sorry, my voice went out there anyway. We have a choker. Uh, this is a CR1 monster. I believe this actually appeared first in one of the guild adept adventures. And I'm curious, I didn't actually go back and look to see if this is any different. It may, I don't think it's the turtle package. I do believe it's like Ruins of Mesro or one of the guild uh, adept adventures has this creature in it and i'm like i said i'm curious if it's the same one this is a creature that's been around for a while low level aberration um subterranean predator far more dangerous than its small size and spindly rubber limbs would suggest um basically they are trappers and hunters and they kind of will see it here so uh dark vision stealth checks make sense only 13 hp and 16 ac so they're not going to be too tough but as a cr1 for a first level party this could be pretty nasty um so aberrant quickness is once per short or long rest it gets an extra basic guys action service gets an extra action on its turn uh it can move through spaces this is just creepy if you think about it uh move through and occupy a space as narrow as four inches wide without squeezing and it can climb on difficult surfaces and ceilings and things so it makes two attacks so if you think about it it makes two tentacle attacks and if it uses its aberrant quickness that makes two more so it's potentially four attacks for one monster that's a cr1 so that could potentially be pretty nasty to a first level party. Uh, 10 foot reach, only 1d4 plus 3 bludgeoning damage and a d6 piercing damage. As you can see, its claws have uh, spikes in them. But if it's a large or smaller creature, it is grappled. Until the grapple ends, the target is restrained and the choker can't use this tentacle on another target. The choker has two tentacles. If the attack is a critical hit, the target also can't breathe or speak until the grapple ends. So the only kind of downside to this is... If it's a large or smaller creature, which chances are it probably will be, it will grapple them. And if it's grapple them, it can't use its tentacle again. So I'm not entirely sure how the aberrant quickness comes into play. So it reaches out, it attacks somebody, and it hits them. They're grappled. Then it grabs somebody else with the second attack. Grappled. It has two more attacks, but it can't use its tentacle on another target unless it can just, like, it doesn't have like a constrict ability unless it can just use its tentacle attack again on the same creature. Or maybe it does enough damage to put them unconscious. Um, I don't know. That's kind of a weird mechanic if you think about it. Uh, next we have clockwork characters. So Gnome's efforts to invent and tinker with magic mechanical devices relayed in many failed constructs. So we have a whole bunch of these in varying levels. So a bronze scout um, is basically a burrowing kind of worm-like creature. You can see it here. CR1. It is a construct, though, so it's going to have some decent abilities here, like immune to poison and bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage from non-magical attacks that aren't adamantine. This could seriously mess up a low-level party 
because if you do not have magic weapons, you are screwed. Uh, because it is immune to that damage, so you're gonna hopefully have a caster in your party, uh, or somehow have a magic weapon when you're CR1. Or if you hit multiple of these, this could be potentially pretty bad. 18 HP, 13 AC, um, it does not provoke attacks of opportunity when it burrows, and it can burrow underground. And it also has advantage on saving throws versus spells and magical effects, so even if you do have a caster, it could be potentially pretty bad. Uh, does a D4 piercing damage plus a D6 lightning damage. D4 plus 3 plus a D6 lightning. This could be pretty dangerous, again, to a low-level party. And it does lightning flare, which, again, this could be real bad, depending on how you roll. Uh, short or long rest. Each creature in contact with the ground within 15 feet of the bronze scout must make a DC 13 deck save, or take 46 lightning damage on a failed save, or half on a success. So one of these little guys could seriously mess up a low-level party, or a handful of these, like around, you get like five or four or five of these against like a second or third level party um or maybe even a fourth level party you could do some serious damage if they all activate the lightning flare ability at the same time that could be pretty rough next up we have the iron cobra so it just looks like a metal snake and it also looks pretty cool kind of gives me an arbok style vibe for you pokemon fans cr4 uh again similar scenarios with the immunities and condition immunities uh 45 hp 13 ac still has the magic resistance as it is a construct it's got its bite attack, uh, 1d6 plus 3 piercing, and if they fail a constitution saving throw, it suffers a random effect. One, uh, it takes an extra 3d8 poison damage. Oof. Confusion. On this next turn, the target must use its action to make one melee, or one weapon attack, rather. I guess a random creature it can see within 30 feet using whatever weapon it has in its hand and moving beforehand, if necessary, to get in range. If it's holding no weapon, it makes an unarmed strike. If there's no creature visible within 30 feet, it makes a dash action uh, moving towards the nearest creature. Or paralysis. The turn is paralyzed until the end of its next turn. Those are all pretty solid. I mean, 3d8 poison damage, you're a CR4, so you're a little higher level. But that's still a decent amount of damage. But the paralysis, if there's any other creatures in this fight, this could be pretty bad. And again, same scenario. Confusion uh, moving to attack an ally could be pretty rough. Um, but again, still a cool creature. Oaken Bolter, this is basically a sentient ballista. Uh, um, I mean, it has an intelligence of three. Uh, it's only a CR5, so it's a little bit higher than your Iron Cobra, Cobra but it's a dragon-headed ballista that can do its own thing. Same resistances, same immunities, same magic resistance ability. 58 HP, 16 AC. It does make two Lancing Bolt attacks, or one Lancing Bolt attack and a Harpoon attack. So Lancing Bolt has a range of short range of 100 feet, long range of 400. 2d10 plus 4 piercing damage. Pretty nasty. Uh, then we have the harpoon attack. Uh, 50 foot short range, 200 foot long range. d10 plus 4 piercing. The target is grappled. While grappled in this way, a creature's speed isn't reduced, but it can only move in directions that bring it closer to the bolter. A creature takes 1d10 slashing damage if it escapes from the grapple or if it tries and fails. As a bonus action, the oaken bolter can pull the grappled creature 20 feet closer. Uh, it can only grapple one creature at a time. And then a recharge on a 5-6 is its explosive bolt. It chooses a point within 120 feet. Every creature within 20 feet of that needs to make a DC 15 deck save or take 5d6 fire damage on a failed save or half on a success. And I believe this is the last one here is the Stone Defender, which is some sort of shield golem, if you will. Uh, same immunities and all of that, same magic resistance. It does have the false appearance ability, where if um, it remains motionless against an uneven surface, uh, earthen or stone surface, it is indistinguishable from that surface. 52 HP, 16 AC, and we have a slam attack, so not too much. 2d6 plus 4 bludgeoning damage, but if the target is large or small, it is knocked prone, there is no save, it is just knocked prone. An intercept attack, this is very similar to a shield guardian. Uh, in response to another creature within 5 feet being hit by an attack roll, the Stone Defender gives that creature a plus 5 bonus to AC against the attack, potentially causing a miss. To use this ability, the Stone Defender must be able to see the creature and the attacker. So this is basically like a Shield Guardian, except instead of dealing, giving it a plus 2, it gives them a plus 5. So this basically literally gives them the Shield spell. Um, very cool. And then it has stuff about the individual designs here. A gnome artisan values an individualized clockwork more highly than perfect, uh, perfectly functioning one. So it talks about different enhancements you can add to them here. Things like uh, dark vision becomes 120 feet, 
increase its movement speed or its AC, give it a swim speed, and then malfunctioning things that can happen to it to make it again more unique. Roll a d6 at the start of its turn. If you roll a 1, it's incapacitated. There's disadvantage on initiative. Things to make it more unique. Oh, we do have more in the C area. So we have the Corpse Flower. Um, it can sprout atop a grave of an evil necromancer or the remains of a powerful undead. A lot of cool undead theme we've got going on here. Uh, unless it is uprooted and burned while it is still seedling, it grows to enormous size over several weeks, then tears itself free and begins scavenging humanoid corpses. Um, it stuffs the remains of its body and feeds on carrion to replace it uh, to repair itself. Um, and it has a horrible odor. The stench, which serves as a defensive mechanism, fades 2d4 after it dies. 2d4 days after it dies. So we can see it here. Pretty weird looking. Um, so immune to blind and deafen has blind sight out to 120 feet, 127 HP, 12 AC. So it does not have, it appears, any of the vulnerabilities that plants typically have. Sometimes plants have vulnerability to fire damage. Uh, it does not have that. So corpses. When first encountered, a corpse flower contains the corpses of 1d6 plus 3 humanoids. Again, could be a very cool encounter based on how you set that up. Uh, corpse flower can hold the remains of up to 9 dead humanoids. These remains have total cover against attacks and other effects outside the corpse flower. If the corpse flower dies, the corpses within it can be pulled free. While it has at least one humanoid corpse in its body, the corpse flower can use a bonus action to do one of the following. It digests one of the corpses, which could be pretty awful if it's a party member goes unconscious and they pull it in and then they digest it. Regaining 2d10 hit points, nothing of the digested body remains. Any equipment on the corpse flower is expelled in its space. So this is a way to have to stick your party with a resurrection spell or a reincarnate, not giving them access to raise dead or revivify if you want to be that brutal. Um, it can animate the dead body into a zombie. The zombie appears within five feet of the corpse. The zombie acts as an ally for the corpse flower, but isn't under its control, and the flower's stench clings to it. And we'll see the stench of death trait in a second. Spider climb. It can climb on walls and ceilings. Stench of death. Each creature that starts a turn within ten feet of the corpse flower or one of its zombies must make a DC 14 con save unless it is a construct or undead. On a failed save, the creature is incapacitated until the end of the turn. Creatures that are immune to poison or poison condition automatically succeed. On success, you are immune to the stench for 24 hours. And lastly, on top of all of that nonsense, it can make three tentacle attacks a turn. They have a reach of 10 feet, they do 2d6 plus 2 bludgeoning damage, and the target must make a dc14 con save or take an additional 4d6 poison damage. Or if it doesn't want to do its tentacle attacks, it can harvest the dead the corpse flower grabs one secured, uh, unsecured dead humanoid within 10 feet of it and stuffs it into itself, along with any equipment the corpse flower is, uh, the corpse is wearing or carrying. The remains can be used with the corpse's trait. This is nasty. It's a CR8 uh, plant, which again we don't have a ton of plants. We have a lot of low-level plants. We have like treants and then shambling mounds, and this one is just terrifying. So. Anyway, guys, that's my review of the A through C beast area of Morden Canaan's Tome of Foes. Let me know what you think in the com uh, in the comments below, and be on the lookout for a soon to come out top ten monsters of Morden Canaan's Tome of Foes that I will be doing for an upcoming top ten Tuesday. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'll see you for monsters D through F next time.